Okay, well, I'm, I'm Andy Russell. Uh, I'm the, uh, the, the junior uh, deputy chair of BSG. Um, and uh, that, that's my kind of role at the moment. And uh, it, it gives me great pre uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Stuart Lane, who's editor in chief of Earth Surface Processes and Landforms. Uh, Stuart's going to be uh, talking uh, about uh, our, our title, uh, his talks entitled Our Fair. Uh, are the FAIR data requirements really very FAIR? An editor's view on changing publication requirements. So uh, I'm going to hand over to, to Stuart. And uh, again, if you could, uh, if you've got questions for Stuart, if we could put them into the chat and that way we can, uh, we, we can facilitate a discussion and Stuart will be available for that as well. So uh, I'll uh, sign off now and hopefully uh, you, you'll, you'll see Stuart's uh, presentation. Everyone. Everyone. Um, as part of my uh, sort of annual report to the society on its journal Earth Surface Processes and Landforms, I'll just make a few uh, remarks about what's been going on at ESBL uh, in the last year. Um, and then I'll um, start to talk a little bit more about um, the main theme I want to think about today, which is really data and some of the issues that are, uh, we're experiencing uh, as a community uh, in uh, something called fair data, which I think most of us will have been unable to uh, avoid. Um, just to run fairly quickly through a few comments about ESBIN in the last year, um, it's been a, a, a very um, busy year. Um, I'd like to let's see a little bit about the first Fiona Kirkby awardees that were announced by Stephen this morning, our new editorial system that's been in place since January, a couple of comments on COVID and open access agreements, but spend most of my time talking about our uh, uh, data policy, ESPL, and FAIR uh, 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 issues. Um, firstly, I would just like to, to not just thank the awardees from uh, the Fiona Kirkby uh, Prize this year, um, but all of um, the reviewers at ESPL who do a marvellous job uh, at helping us make decisions on our papers. Most of the people listening in will have received emails from me or from one of my colleagues on the board over the last few years. Uh, and uh, I know they sometimes arrive at the worst possible moment, uh, but we do really appreciate what you do. Uh, and this year with the first uh, Fiona Kirkby awardees, we decided we'd, we'd honor just a few more people than we normally do, um, because there are so many people who give us uh, enormous help uh, with the decisions that we make. So congratulations to Peter, Catherine, Hironori, Caroline, and uh, Katie. Um, we have, during the year, moved on to the new editorial system with the retirement of uh, Fiona Kirkby. Um, what this really does is it splits um, the, the tasks that were split between Wiley, Fiona, and um, the editor and my associate editors uh, into two groups. So we now have a team working at Wiley, um, uh, notably um, Harsha Ravi, who handles the day-to-day -day running of the technical side of manuscript, uh, checking on manuscripts when they're submitted and so on, and then the work that we're doing um, as, as editors. And we've had quite a few changes uh, in the system. We've modified how we assign associate editors, and I think that's working really well. Um, we've speeded up how we issue decision letters, um, cutting out a couple of steps in the process. Um, we've now got up what I think is a much better special issue management and that's allowing us to handle many more um, special issues and special issue papers. Um, we're tightened up how we, we um, uh, chase reviewers and making sure that happens a little bit more efficiently. And some of you will have now seen if you've had a paper accepted, again, to try and improve the experience of authors with the journal. When your paper gets accepted, we're effectively accepting science but there's now a first look system where you can actually double check that the figures and the presentation of the paper is going to be okay and uh, before that your paper uh, advances out of the editorial system. But the good news of all of this is that our, um, uh, uh, this wonderful, wonderfully messy graph shows what's going on in, in, in the journal. Um, and it is allowing us to speed up quite dramatically um, our times to first decision. That's one of the, the simplest but most important statistics I have to watch as an editor. Um, the red dots uh, on, this act, uh, on this axis relate to the date of submission. 
on the, the, the y-axis, the number of days it takes to make a decision. Um, and the black dots are a, a running mean. And you can see how this, since the new editorial system has, 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 has declined. And we've been doing that by both being more efficient at, at deciding quickly on uh, uh, papers that we don't want to send out to review, but also speeding up um, the handling of papers uh, and the review process. And indeed our, our median um, uh, time to first decision uh, in the most recent data has dropped to shorter than 40 days compared with 60 days um, back in uh, January 2019. So all of that is going uh, in the right way. We also did uh, try an experiment, which we, we failed and we've actually withdrawn it now. We did try reducing the time allowed to review a paper from four weeks to three weeks as some other journals offer. But we found a very, very significant increase in review refusals. So we, um, we very quickly decided that this was not a, a good thing to do. COVID has been having uh, an impact upon us um, in two ways. The first is a substantial uh, increase in submissions. And what I did here was take the last paper I handled um, uh, this week, which was uh, on uh, 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 Sunday, that paper arrived in my inbox. That number was submitted on the 6th of September. And you can see to get to the same number of papers when you look back through the calendar, um, that gives you an idea of the um, increase in submissions that we've had over the last few years, which has been fairly steadily growing, but which has jumped up dramatically um, uh, since um, the, in the COVID year that we're uh, uh, now in. And this is creating uh, a management headache for us, it's in substantially increasing the volume uh, of work. Um, but of course, it's great for the society's journal to be getting uh, lots and lots of um, submissions. But actually, I think it's those figures hide what is my conclusion about how COVID has been affecting the journal. I think there's been a strongly differential impact on both authors and reviewers. Um, so although we are, we seem to be getting some, some COVID effect, as other journals have reported on, on submission rates, um, it's fair to say that we're quite concerned about certain age brackets, notably ECRs, who are more likely to have responsibilities, for instance, for young families, um, and also certain countries who are really suffering uh, much more uh, than others. And it's so, so, so it is, it is without a doubt affecting what we're doing. And what that has meant is we've started to adopt a much more flexible approach to um, the turnaround of reviews, um, extending uh, review return times, uh, also um, allowing authors much more time to revise their papers if they need them, um, so that we don't penalise particular sectors of the community. And also we're having to engage a little bit more actively with authors to help them to understand that there are, uh, for some people, um, significant limits in the rate at which they can review their re review their papers. So uh, finally, in terms of just this quick briefing before I talk about data, uh, some very good news in terms of open access agreements, particularly for the UK or most of the UK community. Um, what we've been seeing for many years now is a progressive shift from the SPL uh, being a hybrid journal where we have this mix of pay to read, open access via the gold route, uh, green open access after an embargo, um, avoiding double dipping so the journal um, doesn't get paid twice. We've been moving towards, uh, away from that, that hybrid model, towards um, the open access model. And this is increasingly done through what are, are, are institute uh, publisher uh, agreements. So um, an institute or a group of institutes, such as the Deal Institutes in Germany, um, instead of paying journal subscriptions, uh, they agree to fund a certain number of open access uh, journals. Um, and these exist for Germany, these exist uh, for Netherlands. And excellent news is that, as many of you will know, there is now one for the JISC uh, UK uh, institutions. What that means is, um, is that subject to certain conditions, um, UK academic geomorphologists, most universities, but not all, most universities are just universities, uh, can actually publish um, uh, using uh, gold uh, open access 
at no charge at ESPL. And of course, unlike some journals, we have no page charges either. And so this is something I would all encourage you to, to take up this opportunity um, of, uh, of using SPL as the outlet for your work, because not only does it not cost you anything, but you now get effectively um, free uh, gold open access. Um, it, doing that has positive financial implications for the royalty payment that the BSG receives from earth surface processes and landforms. And so this is not something that's simply good for you, um, it's also good for the society. And Wiley and the BSG, uh, Wiley looked at the implications for the ESPL uh, BSG royalty, and actually the shift is, is, is good. It, it, we're, we're, the the society is protected from this change. Um, and indeed, um, uh, it can only lead to a greater royalty if UK geomorphologists um, take the offer uh, up. And if any of you have any questions about that, and um, please do email me uh, or ask me in the chat and I can explain more about how it works. But my main topic today um, is data. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to spend the second half of my talk making a few comments uh, on this. And we've been reflecting on data at ESPL now uh, for four or five years and how we uh, can help the community by making data available through the journal and how we can encourage the community uh, in relation to best practice in uh, data and data publishing. And of course, um, what this means is, is also engaging with this new initiative. Some of you may know uh, and have heard of the FAIR data principles that um, as a community, um, and this is not just geomorphology, it's not just geoscience, it's the, the community, the scientific community and the social scientific community as a, as a whole, um, is the idea that we should be trying to develop fairer data principles. So we should be making our data uh, findable, accessible, um, interoperable, which basically means that different kinds of data files can easily be read, and reusable, that means professionally and properly licensed so that use uh, is fair. And of course, this is not just a policy that is being adopted in, by journals. Um, uh, many journals now require you to make your data available. If you've published in an AGU journal recently, um, you're required to now to, to publish your data. But it's also required um, institutionally and some universities, but also research councils around the world are now insisting that data is properly um, archived and made available for reuse uh, by others uh, in the community. So what's ESPL's data policy? And this is where I, I, I thought I'd raise a few things for you to, to think about. Um, um, the view from ESPL is um, very uh, strongly um, related, or very, very strongly um, uh, of the view that, that data sharing um, is actually a, a good thing. And you can think about some of the reasons for that. One is that if we have time to include it in our reviews, reviewing data, it could be an important part of the review process. I have to say that in my experience, I think, I could count on one hand the number of times reviewers have asked to receive data sets. That's clearly something that could be improved. Um, clearly, when we can share our data, um, we can um, make better use of it. Um, data collection is expensive. And so clearly there's a better return on investment if we can share our data uh, more widely. Um, there's lots of nice studies I've certainly read where by taking data that different groups have collected and combining them together, we can go from what Keith Richards used to call small end studies where our, our individual cases to actually looking at things like global patterns or regional patterns or temporal patterns um, that can help us to see our case studies in different ways. And so clearly data sharing uh, can support that. It's well established that the data we have is important pedagogically. We can animate our lectures and our, our classes um, by getting students working with data, looking at data, uh, rather than simply telling them about those data. And of course, and perhaps most importantly, the data we produce today can become the long-term uh, sources of data in the future uh, for things uh, relating to 
uh, environmental change and how is it that we're going to be able to say something about environmental change impacts on earth surface processes and geomorphological uh, and on landforms in um, uh, 50 to 100 years if we don't start ar archiving our measurements of those data today. So the general view um, from ESPL is that in principle data sharing is a, is a, is a good thing and it's something we should be trying to do. But we've also been reflecting on challenges and actually the, the um, editorial that I wrote wanted to bring up some of those challenges, not so much to argue that data sharing is a bad thing, but more to make the community think about data with its eyes open, because there are, are some big implications. One of the things that, that I've started to see as an editor in some of the papers that are using um, online databases um, poses the question, can we really work with data when we've not been partly at least uh, involved in collecting it? Now, of course we can, I mean, there's a long history of using um, long-term environmental data sets in fields close to what we do, discharge records from rivers, uh, for instance, um, climate data. But there are some issues we have to think about. Um, the first is inappropriate data use. And I, I recently had to handle as, as associate editor a paper that um, involved um, use of some geomorphological data from a database um, that uh, was quite clear that the authors of the paper were using those data inappropriately because they hadn't been involved in collecting it. Perhaps more to the point, they hadn't um, uh, been involved in looking at the preparation behind those data. And the, the, the fact that many of the data that we might wish to compare and combine need to be homogenized so that they give you um, the same signal. The difficulty we have sometimes in data of, of re removing the particularities that are in the data uh, that come from the particular place that you're working in um, as compared with what you might be able to generalize uh, truly uh, from data. So when you see pattern in data, is it is it truly a pattern that can be generalized and related to a particular process or a particular hypothesis? Or is the generalization simply a, a product of all the different influences that combine the data point uh, that we have? Concerns about um, uh, field work and the importance um, uh, of the signal that we send out to the community about what matters. Um, feel, we don't have any data without field work uh, for most of, most of us. Um, but fieldwork is not just about producing data, it's all about those other things that we learn when we're sitting in, a, in, a, in an exciting landscape, watching what it's doing, getting new ideas, perhaps with other people who think differently about the landscape. So the importance of the field then is not just a place to generate data, but as a place to generate ideas that might help us to think about how we collect data. Concerns about the free ride problem and um, really two elements there. One is issues regarding whether or not um, people really um, who use data understand the effort that is required in collecting it, um, the personal effort as well as the, the practical effort, but also um, a growing tendency. And it's, it's a little bit behind the example I, I was thinking of when I was um, putting this talk together. Um, what, what you lack uh, in your papers when you don't take time to talk with the producers of data and the very rich scientific exchanges that can come when you start to think about data together and um, with those who produced it. And so the importance then of making sure that data providers are properly involved uh, in data uh, uh, use and its reuse and not simply taken um, for a free ride. And then finally, what is the environmental cost of data storage and dissemination? And this is one of the things that's worrying uh, me enormously personally at the moment. I have a very big project that's producing about a terabyte of data a day through, um, uh, uh, sorry, through per week through um, imaging. 
And um, my research council requires me to archive these data and to make them available at the end of the project. But what is the environmental cost of doing that? Um, given the immense energy that goes into things like data servers. And so really what, what we, 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 we were thinking about here is, is not just accepting that making data available is a good thing, but developing a policy um, at ESPL um, that recognizes that yes, data are important, they should be preserved. Um, but we need to think a little bit carefully about how that's done. And we need to think a little bit about differences in the kinds of data we produce and differences in the institutional settings uh, that we're in, such that we don't go down the AG route, AG route and um, insist on all data being um, publicly available uh, all of the time. So we have now um, a new data policy. Um, we want people to share their data, but we not, certainly for the time being, we're not going to oblige them uh, to do so. Of course, others may make it obligatory to share those data. Um, uh, your research council, your, uh, your, um, your um, uh, university uh, and so on. Um, but actually, as a journal, we think it's important to give people um, that choice. So what we've done is we've moved the journal from a category where um, uh, uh, or we've moved it to a category where now we require in all journal articles um, a data statement and we require data to be made available, ideally on a, in a repository, but also on request. So we now we, we're not going to insist that all data are formally published uh, in a repository as some journals have done. We're going to maintain the request uh, uh, viewpoint. Um, but under the expectation that probably through time, the community will be moving towards fully a repository based uh, system. Uh, and that crucially in doing that, we must not forget uh, that uh, data take time and money to collect and that it's very sad if those who invest in the hard work uh, required to collect data are not also uh, fully involved um, in making use of those data in the in the way that they should be used without making some of the mistakes um, that we've seen we've been seeing so I think I'm just up uh, in terms of my time. Uh, so um, uh, uh, I thought I'd finish with just one observation. Um, my biggest concern, and this is a personal concern, is that one of the things about the automation and mechanization associated with data analysis is we do need to be a little bit careful um, that we don't end up letting machines go beyond data and be doing all our jobs for us, writing papers, um, uh, etc. And so there's a word of caution in a more philosophical sense here, a little a bit deeper than perhaps I've been able to develop in my argument. Um, but we must try as much as we can also to think about um, data and what the long term consequences are of some of the shifts towards mechanism, mechanization and automation uh, in research that is behind things like the FAIR initiative. I think that was all I wanted to say. Um, I can see already one um, question. Um, so, yeah. So, Andy, Andy, do you want me to um, start responding to Heather's question? Yeah, yeah. Th but th thanks very much, Stuart, for that. That was uh, very much appreciated, and uh, you know, really clear message about uh, you know publishing in ESPNL. Um, you know, benefits for authors and and the society. Um, yes, if you're if you're happy to um, address, I think Heather's got a question on the the, the Q and A session, and um, I think um, uh, Stephen's got a, a another question which uh, is in the general uh, is in the panelist chat list. So, uh, okay, yeah, um, Heather's question: Has there been any sign of a of gender related issues in terms of submissions? Um, uh, have submissions from women fallen? Um, no, uh, I looked at the, the gender balance uh, statistics and actually there's been no real pattern uh, in, in gender uh, uh, at all. However, um, where I think I have seen a pattern um, is 
uh, in terms of a re some reduced submissions from what you might call younger uh, geomorphologists. We actually don't record age at submission, perhaps we should, um, uh, but there is certainly, um, uh, I think, uh, in terms of the requests for extensions to revisions to papers and the extension of uh, requests for time to review, that is definitely something I'm seeing coming much, much more from the younger members of the community than the older ones. So at the moment, I don't see a gender uh, 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 signal in terms of submissions um, or noticeably in terms of re review extension requests, revision extension requests, but there is certainly an age signal. And perhaps that's a good sign of a changing times that that things like domestic responsibilities are a little bit more distributed than they might have been a few years ago. I, I don't know. Thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, so Heather's just added at career stage, very important. Um, I've got, you've got one from Mike there, but before that, there's one from uh, Stephen uh, asking if you could talk about the, the, the GISC, uh, you know, the, you know the, the open access deal yeah. and, uh, how that goes beyond the UK, so for Europe and other, yeah. other, you know, other countries overseas. Yes, so um, the, uh, G the GISC agreement uh, is one of a, a series of agreements that Wiley is negotiating uh, at the moment predominantly with European countries. So there is now one for um, pretty much all of the Scandinavian countries, uh, Germany, uh, Netherlands, uh, some Austrian uh, universities, Switzerland's about to sign one, uh, and now and the UK. Um, so it's a very much a European model, which is perhaps not surprising because it's the Euro it's in Europe that there's been the biggest uh, pressure to uh, adopt um, a gold a a open uh, access uh, system. Um, so yes, I think I think that uh, uh, it's uh, it's actually something that's that's quite a good opportunity for the BSG. And what we did with Germany is when the German agreement was signed, um, we launched a special issue to grow submissions via the German Geomorphology Working Group, and that was a that's been a wonderful success. I mean, we've had about uh, thirty odd submissions to that compared with 15 or so per year from, from German geomorphologists. It's a bit different for the UK because actually with the BSG, we've already agreed to start having an annual special issue linked to the um, BSG annual meeting, which I think is like to start next year, um, which is a, a sort of um, a, a, an initiative that will, will allow us to um, keep the BSG AGM as it should be, um, but, uh, at the same time um, uh, uh, allows us to um, publish a, a special issue that follows from part of the uh, of the um, of the AGM and that will hopefully also grow the UK submissions. I have to say as an editor one of my biggest worries is is, is submissions from the UK which historically uh, have declined substantially um, and I had talked to the BSG um, executive committee about the reasons for that and what we can do to address it. So, yeah. Thank you. There's a, there's a, Mike's got a question on the uh, Q&A um, and then followed by another one from Richard. Yeah, meta studies uh, in particular areas. And um, I think that's actually a really interesting idea. Um, it's perhaps something that that as a ESPL could have a uh, uh, a look at doing. Um, we have the odd uh, state of science article that touches on meta studies. I mean, sometimes it's a little bit more in terms of publications than it is actually data, uh, but um, that could well be very interesting. And one of the advantages of, of um, meta studies is it can actually be a very good signal for how to improve uh, data quality. And I'm thinking here of what the um, critical zone network uh, did in the US early on in um, improving the way in which the critical zone is, is monitored, data protocols and so on. So, so that's, a, that's an interesting suggestion. So yeah, I could perhaps, um, I perhaps give that some thought, yeah. Um, second one is a very interesting question. What role should the society have in relation to data storage and um, standards? Um, could or should we have a data repository 
um, for standards for upload and data use. Um, but for geomorphic data, and I think personally, I mean, I'm persuaded, I could be persuaded otherwise. Personally, I think that there are some very good um, repositories suited to geomorphology as a branch of the geosciences already out there. So I'm thinking about Pangaea, for example, as, uh, as one of those. Um, and actually, I think the, the effort to run a, a data repository correctly uh, and it's not something you can do one off because you've, you've got to the, the software that will host the data and allow access to it, for instance, will change as fast as the Internet changes. I'm not sure that would actually be something feasible for um, uh, the, 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 the BSG uh, or, or, or a journal to be looking at. And we do archive uh, data through the journal if people wish us to. That's that's no problem. However, where I think the society does have a very important role is data standards protocols um, and we've been thinking just a little bit about um, uh, data and uh, how we can uh, make data a bit more uh, available um, uh, uh, in a way that, that that strengthens the quality of the data and it's interesting that many data management plans now required by research councils don't just require you to archive the data they require you to archive the protocols used to produce those data and that I think is something where there could be a very good community sharing initiative uh, with, with those that would improve how we collect data. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, I think uh, uh, Heather's added in the uh, general chat about, um, you know, the importance of, um, you know, metadata that's attached to the, um, you know, the, you know how, how important it is to get better use of the data, you know, but actually adding in uh, detailed metadata. And, and I think the thing that, that that strikes me is obviously there's a lot of data sets that are, um, you know, how do you put in a, you know, a, a sedimentary section log or, uh, you know, that there, there are sort of, you know, you know, maybe protocols or, uh, you know, get outlining, you know, standards and procedures, geo, geo referencing photos, etc. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, guidelines and, and on that, you know, and how to uh, archive stuff would be very useful and, and again making it more useful for the wider community so uh, that's that's great so thank thanks very much for everybody for the questions uh, any uh, i'll